Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mark Frankel. I am the current president of the American Shoulder Rebel Society. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit uh, before we get started about political advocacy. Um, as you might know, that it's very important for us uh, to support the AAOS PAC as ASES members, fellow members, or candidate members. Uh, when we make contributions to the PAC, no matter how small they are, it goes to uh, ranking us in terms of the participation of our group. So we have a 100% participation of our ASCS members, candidate members, and fellow members. Uh, we are uh, given priority in terms of the things that are important to us to advocate for. For example, 29826, arthroscopic subacromity compression is a, a code that might uh, uh, be at peril for us. So it's important that we have uh, the PAC advocate for us uh, to make sure that we can continue to get paid for the work that we do. So that's my plea and uh, I look forward to tonight's session. Thanks Joaquin, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank, and welcome everyone. Tonight, over the next hour, we're gonna try to review a few concerns about revision shoulder alphoplasty. And uh, before we begin, I wanna say hello and welcome our faculty tonight, Dr. Mark Frankel and Dr. Stephanie Mu. Dr. Frankel is one of the busiest revision Alphoplasty surgeons that I know, and you will see through the presentation that many of the things that we discuss, he actually came up with. And Dr. Mu is a very, very busy shoulder and elbow surgeon in the Detroit area, so thank you very much for being here. These are my disclosures, which some of them are actually relevant to the presentation tonight, and they can be found at the AOS website. So today we're gonna to talk about basically three sections in our presentation. The first is what makes revision shoulder so special? Then we'll talk about how do we do a revision, thinking about how do you deal with bone loss and soft tissue loss, and I'll give you a few final thoughts that I think are relevant as you think about your future career. So what's so special about revision shoulder arthroplasty? Why is it different than hip and knee arthroplasty? Number one, we have reverse arthroplasty as an explosion in the field of revision surgery. So this graph shows the number of revision arthroplasties done in my institution between the 70s and currently, and the green line is reversed. So you can see how reverse has escalated substantially. So Mark, I was gonna ask you, how many of your revisions do you think you estimate are reverses? Um, I would say 95%. 95%. Stephanie, for you, can you give me one example of one revision where you wouldn't revise to a reverse? Um. That's a hard one. I mean, I, I guess the only one recently that I have think about is one with so much severe bone loss on the glenoid that it couldn't, wasn't compatible for a base plate. So I ended up having to do like a CTA hemiarthroplasty. So that's a very good point for the fellow. So I think the, the two indications for non-reverse revision would be the one that Stephanie mentioned when there's no bone on the glenoid. Also maybe the failed painful hemi that has an integrated or cuff and you revise to a total. But the reality is that reversing the vision is very, very attractive. Why? Number one, it doesn't depend on the rotator cuff. So you don't have as many worries about the stability and potentially you get better function. Number two, the fixation on the glenoid is clearly superior. It is cementless, based on screws and facilitates grafting on augments. The second thing that is important about revision is to understand the difference in size of the bones of the skeleton of the shoulder. So we have heard recently this emphasis about short stems and stems, which I think are very relevant, but what really matters is the glenoid bolt. So as you look at CT scans of your patients with no previous surgery, you can see how the glenoid is a very small bone in humans. So as you think about the possibility of revision compromising bone stock even further, you can realize how one of the main goals of your surgery, primary and is to preserve glenoid bone stock. Number three, the rotator cuff. Of course, we know that reverse is very, very good for active elevation, but maybe not so much for active internal rotation. Stephanie, do you think that recently with reverse, you have improved the number of patients that get internal rotation, or is it still a challenge? Uh, it's definitely still a challenge, but I do think with the uh, like sort of fourth generation reverses uh, that we've come to uh, appreciate more the lateralization where we can get the rotator cuffs uh, more lateralized. And, uh, you know, I found that with that, I've, my internal rotation has improved quite a bit 
it used to be that I told people that internally, we're lucky if we can get you to sort of do personal care for toileting. Now I'm starting to get higher and higher. Some women are able to do their bras even now, so. I would agree. I think it's more predictable currently. On the contrary, when you have a patient that has no posterior cap, no supra, no infra, no teres minor, I think it's difficult with a reverse to get a standard rotation. Mark, your uh, DGO group has published occasionally papers where you can actually get pretty good external rotation. Is that the case if you don't have a teres minor in the revision setting or not? No. no, no. So if you don't have teres minor, you would agree that in a revision you have to do something to get the standard rotation? You know, in a revision, I generally accept a lesser type of uh, outcome because I believe that the complication rate starts to go up as the complexity of the surgery goes up. So if, if there's a lot of humeral bone loss, for example, or a lot of glenoid bone loss or a lot of particular wear um, that I'm having to manage, then I'm not gonna go through heroic efforts to improve their extra rotation. And I, I try to let them know that the outcome for a revision operation uh, should not be confused uh, to what they can expect from their index operation. In fact, when I talked to them about when they can consider surgical treatment, I said, well, you'd like to be worse than you were before you had your index operation because the change won't be as good. That's a very good point. So for our fellows, I think it's important to realize that even though we know reverse compensates for the lateral calf to some extent, when you do a revision, if the calf is intact, your goal is to maintain it intact especially the posterior calf. And at least in my practice, a fracture of the gear tuberosity is an not uncommon complication when I try to pull out a humeral component. So remember when you go to the OR to try to preserve the gear tuberosity as much as you can. Finally, we have this little bacteria called Cutibacterium acnes, which is really a challenge because of the diagnosis. So most of the preventive testing is actually negative because of the prophylaxis, because it's actually deeper in the dermal glands, so superficial skin preparation probably doesn't touch this uh, bacteria, and because of the pigment, which is difficult to treat. So then when we go to meetings, we'll hear people saying, well, why do you even work up the failed shoulder alphoplasty? And I was gonna ask you guys, Mark, do you aspirate every failed shoulder alphoplasty? No. Stephanie? I do. So it's interesting, you know, yes and no. And uh, this is a graph that shows the bacteriology of the patients we have taken to Mayo Clinic recently for surgery for an infection. So this is biased because it doesn't include unexpected positive culture. But you can see how many infections that we take to the OR are not by C. acnes. So I think to that extent, maybe working at the patients is worth it, but it can be very confusing. As you know, we have to talk to our microbiology laboratory so that the cultures are held for 14 days or longer. And some people advocate when you don't know for sure a diagnostic arthroscopy. Stephanie, do you ever scope a shoulder before revision to see if there is infection? Is that completely out of your practice? Um, I've done it once or twice where it, I don't see any signs as to uh, an infection, like, you know, osteolysis or anything. Um, I'll scope it and, I, and I'll actually get, I'll do it to get a tissue biopsy. Mark, do you do that or do you think that's just bogus and not really worth it? Well, you know, I did, I did it recently, and I, I think it was a mistake. It was a patient that was very painful. I, there was nothing obvious. I thought the patient may be infected. I scoped him. He was infected. His glenoid was grossly loose, so I took out his glenoid. I did a debridement, and then I found myself in a position of telling the guy, well, maybe this will be sufficient. So we treated him for six weeks, and he did not do uh, very well. And I, I finally took him back after completing that course, and he was still infected. So, you know, um, I don't, for that particular case, it sort of soured my thought because it really, it made me do something that if I would have gone in and opened him up because I would have been highly suspicious of a loose glenoid, I think he would have been better off. That's a very good point. So as we well, can see, there is a lot of confusion around C. acnes and the implications. So these are the four main things that I think make revision shoulder very different from what you have seen in residency about hip and knee alphoplasty revision. Okay, so let's do a revision. Where do we start? With the patient evaluation. And I think it's important to take a great history and physical, that's obvious. It's important to have good quality radiographs. But I think in some cases you have to do further studies in terms of more imaging for the patients with a failed shoulder alphoplasty. 
So one thing that is useful to assess the all polyethylene glenoid component is sequential x-rays. You can see this x-rays taken at time zero, two years, 10 years, and 16 years, that you can see the migration of the component. So I think as a fellow, when you go to your practice, make an effort to call the old x-rays to compare. The other thing that is important in patients with severe bone loss is to get an x-ray of both humeri with markers. That will give you a sense of how much bone are you really missing. I like CT scan and I like CTR program because with a CTR program, you can still see your bone loss, you can assess the rotator cuff and you can assess the glenoid uh, loosening when you have an all poly component. So Mark, what is your go-to test to assess the rotator cuff in a failed arthroplasty? Is it your exam, ultrasound, MRI or CT scan? Or CTR? No, uh, you know, I'm I don't really think so much about the uh, rotator cuff um, per se, unless I have a painful shoulder replacement. And I think that the reason the patient's painful is because they have an unstable glenar humeral joint because of cuff deficiency. So, you know, plain x-rays, physical exam, and CT scan is basically my, my workup. But I, I don't, because since I'm gonna do a reverse, whether the cuff is, has a tear or not, it's not really going to impact my decision making about whether I'm going to do surgery um, in, in those patients. So I guess it would be only the very rare occasion where you revise a failed PEMI to a total, or which is very rare in our practice, as we all said, right? Yes. And something that I think it's important to emphasize, if you take culture, which I do take cultures in every revision, is to use different instruments for each of the samples. So I my institution, we have a little tray that you can see on your left that has four hemostats and four nipples, and then we take those four samples with clean instruments, and we also send the implants for sonication. Stephanie, do you take cultures in every failed arthroplasty, or is it a waste of time? Because then there is the controversy of the unexpected was the culture, right? So right. what's your thoughts? So I, I take cultures on every single revision, and I do a minimum of five cultures, tissue and swabs. Mark? Yeah, we, we have a, a bone protocol in our institution where we send five uh, tissue samples. We send it for aerobic, anaerobic. We send it for AFB and fungal. We also take a piece of tissue that's saved at, I think it's minus 70 degrees centigrade, which is a sort of a bacterial static. So if you want to go back and do any complex serology, you can. We did sonication early on, maybe in the 90s, but we had a ton of false positives. So we, we stopped doing that. Very good, that's a great point. So once you have the question patient- the group, Joaquin, a question for the group. How long yes. do you keep the cultures? 14 days. No 21 days for anybody? For me, 14 days. Stephanie? We've tried to get 21 days, but we can't get microbiology to agree to it, you know, because of the cost of it. So they would only allow us to do 14 days. Mark? Yeah, you know, I, I have a, a situation where the same infectious disease group has been working with me since I was a resident, so over 30 years. So every revision automatically gets an ID consult, and I have them manage the cultures and everything. That way, I don't have to feel like I'm conti continually checking them, but I believe it's 14 days. Again, we save that tissue that we uh, freeze. If there's a question, we can uh, rethaw that and reculture it. How about you, Ranjan? What do you guys do in California? We're 14, but I've been trying to push to 21, and I've been too much pushback. So I was just trying to hope that you all had more success. No. no, I, would no be success. I, I would be concerned, you know, because at some point, you know, there, I think Joe, uh, Joe Anani, or, or maybe the Rothman group shows, you know, the, the time it turns positive is, is probably indicative of whether it's a contaminant or not. So the ones that turn positive way late are more likely to be a result of some contamination as opposed to a true infection. Mark, so, um, Mark that's a question, question just came up. Is there a concern about false positives after 14 days? Right. So that's what I was going to say. The, it's when, when do you consider the cultures being positive, being false positive? Well, for me, if I have one of five, that for me typically is considered a contaminant. Anything two or more, I typically consider that I have to treat the patient. I'm the same way, except if I get one out of five and uh, intraoperatively, I see something of concern. 
um, then I'll still consider that a positive. So we move on to component removal. You can see there a little corkscrew to pull out the components. And the message here is that you have to be really careful about bone preservation. Removing wealthiest components is the most important part of your overall planning because you can plan to do a simple revision and it can be a disaster if you're not careful. So what I try to do is go through a stepwise fashion and I will show you a video in just a couple of slides. I start from the top. If that is unsuccessful, then I move to a corticotomy. So dividing the anterior femoral cortex longitudinal with a saw. If the implant is cemented, I also divide the cement. And that can be, be converted to a window if the corticotomy is not successful. Be careful with having an uncontrolled fracture. So once you have that window, if your assistant is trying to help you by rotating the arm, it's very easy to get a spiral fracture of the humerus. And also remember the radial nerve. It's very easy, especially when you do wire fixation to get an injury to the radial nerve. And as we will talk about later, and Dr. Frankel will share his experience, it is okay to leave cement behind unless there is infection. And we'll talk later on about the cement within cement technique. On the lenoid. Well, Joaquin, before you continue, there are a bunch of questions from the infection from the last part. So I'd like to go back. Sure. First is for the panel, when you take cultures for every revision, what do you do with the patient who ends up with positive cultures after you've done a, a, a one stage revision? So I, I, I'll, uh, I'll address that because I think the idea of a one stage versus two stage in my practice is sort of a, I don't like that terminology. Um, I think about when I do the surgery, whether or not I'm going to try to have a implant that will be a permanent, meaning really well fixed, or one that I think is more impermanent, meaning easier to remove. So if I have a more suspected case of infection, I'll do a hemi spacer, which is a neural implant where I coat the cement and I let it get really tacky and I implant it. And I'll only do a second stage on that patient if the patient clinically doesn't seem to resolve their clinical symptoms of infection, pain, sed rate, stiffness. So in every case I do, it's a first stage surgery and only will their uh, lack of recovery uh, make me consider additional surgery. Yeah, for me, Ranjan, if I find that situation, I do treat the patient and I'm sure that I overtreat some patients, but I'm fearful that if I need a composite construction, it's gonna fail if I don't treat infection. So if I find two, three or four cultures, I will treat that patient with antibiotics. Will you take out your prosthesis? No. You just put in? No. Stephanie? The same way, if I end, end up doing a permanent implants, I will aggressively treat them and make sure ID is aware that there was no planned second surgery to go back. Okay, and then another question from the fellows. Does anyone know how the micro lab handles the cultures? Meaning, do they take it out and look at it every day, every three days, or just once and then at the end of 14 days? In our institution, it's daily. Same with us, it's daily. And ours too. So we move on to glenoid component removal. For me, if it's an all polyethylene component, I don't really care to contact the manufacturer because if it's loose, very easy to remove. If it's well fixed, you can cut the plastic with a saw and you're done. But if you face a failure of a metal bar component, either anatomic or a fail reverse, I think you should contact the manufacturer and have the right screwdriver and the right extraction tools is important. I like to use the 90 degree blade that we use for lateral jet procedures to go around the base plate. I think it's a very useful tool. And sometimes you have to have a metal cutting bird to go through those components. So I'll show you what I call a revision light, the easy revision. So this is a patient that had a failed anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. The uh, glenoid component was uh, well fixed and the humeral component was so thick as well but there was calf failure. And you can see how using a roller bear and an extractor most of the times is easy to remove these components. If you can't, then you move on to the corticotomy. And if you're there, you can't take the component out, then you would move next to your window. Then we're gonna uh, get a correction of our version, typically do that with the brooch and a calcar reamer. Most of the times we're gonna be lowering the cut when we revise an anatomic to reverse or sometimes to reverse. So my philosophy is that any piece of bone that comes from the humerus, I actually save for bone grafting. Sometimes you need some morselized graft. And if you have to lower your cut, a good strategy is those pieces of bone, keep them so that you can actually use them for bone grafting and you can fine tune the height and version of your cut 
with a calca rimmer if you think it is necessary. When you approach the glenoid component, I try to uh, test it a little bit, but I don't try really hard because it's very easy to crush the glenoid underneath. So if I realize right away that the component is well fixed, I typically use a microslide or saw, and if you cut carefully through the plastic and then the cement, you can typically remove that component in small pieces, and that's a very successful uh, mechanism most of the times to remove the component. So now let's talk about when things get more complicated. We talked about the evaluation of the patient. We talked about how to do a more simple revision. But what if you have really bad bone loss? Because this is the challenge in shoulder arthroplastic revision surgeries. What when you have not enough bone to support your component? And it can be on the glenoid side, on the humeral side, or both. So on the glenoid side, there is basically three concepts that I think are important for our fellows to remember. One is that sometimes, many times, you can use a bone graft. It can be allograft or autograft, and there is many sources. Or you can re, um, reconstruct the bone that is missing with a metal augment, or you can, call, you can use the so-called alternative scapular spine center line. So for bone graft, I must confess that this has become my go-to for most of the contained cavitary defects. This is the distal clavicle. So on your left, you can see a little bit approach and very easily you can extend the skin incision, get a saw, and the distal clavicle is just perfect for a contained cavitary defect. Mark, any experience using distal clavicle autograph for your revisions? Do you like it, dislike it? You know, I, I started using it uh, a few years ago and uh, the first one or two, I was really happy. And then I had a couple of patients where the bone quality was really poor. Um, so I, I wasn't as pleased. Um, although your picture looks good and makes me think that maybe the next one I'll do, I'll, I'll do that. Because the other option, of course, is to go to the iliac crest. And this is something that Dr. Tom Norris came up with. So in my practice, if I have a smaller defect, I will be okay with allograft. But the minute I have less than 30% contact with native bone, I'm gonna go to an autograft. This is an example of a patient with a fair amount of bone missing. So you can anticipate that when you get to this patient and remove that component, there's gonna be a major hole. So when Tom Morris described this technique, he recommended for either very large contained defects or a segmental defect, where first you're gonna prepare your glenoid and see how much bone you have actually to contact your base plate after rimming. And here you have to be careful about how much you rim. And this sounds crazy, but this is the way he described it. And I've done it this way, and I think it works really well. You're actually going to rim the pelvis of the patient, so the iliac crest with the rimmers, and then you're going to fix your component with one screw in this case, and then you can use a saw to cut out a rectangle, tricortical rectangle of iliac crest, and then move it to the patient's glenoid. And that technique can be useful in patients with severe uh, bone loss. Uh, Stefan, is this something that you still use, or do you think iliac crest bone graft is too much? I used it uh, earlier in my career and um, patients really hated it. So I started, you know, going to like femoral head uh, allograft. Have you noticed any change in your incorporation of the components with allograft as opposed to autograft or not really? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the auto, uh, allograft probably isn't as good. Um, so I'm not super happy with it, but it's really hard to convince my patients to want to take a, a chunk of their pelvis out. Very good. So now I'd like to uh, invite Mark Frankel to describe this concept of the alternative scapular center line because this is Mark, your idea. So can you explain to the fellows how you came about with this idea and how does it help you in the revision setting, please? Well, you know, in, uh, early on in, in reverse, uh, my experience of reverse, it was unclear about how much bone you needed to have secure fixation of your base plate to the patient's scapula. And uh, you know, I think the first article we published in 2005, we said something like 15 millimeters. And um, it turned out that it really would depend where you measured it. Meaning that, you know, the standard way of, of thinking about where you put your implant is based upon some version of the implant relative to the normal version of the glenoid. So, you know, the standard center line is you go perpendicular to the face of the glenoid as seen in the top image and you come out uh, slightly anterior, turns out that that is a very consistent number of about 28 millimeters. But if you have substantial uh, bone loss of the glenoid, you can imagine how that distance would become smaller and then reduce the effective bone available for your uh, 
fixation to come in contact with bone. But if you just were to alter your trajectory and now look to where the spine meets the body of the scapula, you, there's a very thick portion of the scapula. It's almost like a cortical bone. And so now if you are able to direct your drill into that bone, you clearly get the sensation of it being a much uh, denser type of bone. And if you're using a screw type of implant, you can tell because you get this great torsion, uh, torsional resistance. So it was sort of based upon putting a drill in, tapping it, feeling where the bone is, like I, I learned in fracture fixation that led me to go down that pathway. And then we did several studies to confirm the validity of that concept. And what happens is you alter the version of, of your base plate. And if you use a hemisphere, that's a little bit more troubling. But if you have two thirds of a sphere or more than a hemisphere, you can often compensate for the angular deformity by using more than a hemisphere. So for the fellows, if you like this concept, I would argue that uh, you should practice in slobons. And you can correct me, Mark, if I'm wrong, but I think you have to start your entry hole on the anterior third of the glenoid, right? Yeah, it, you know, it varies depending upon where you are, because as you get more medial, you actually don't have to go as anterior because you're getting more closer to the where the, the body and the scapula spine meet. But and then you it, place it in, in antepression of what, 20 degrees or so? Well, it, again, it, it varies depending upon the glenoid bone loss. I've, I've had it um, in severe bone loss cases where it's like 45 degrees. If you looked at it, it almost looks at right angles. Um, and it, it's, it's very weird. The, those patients seemingly have done really pretty well. Um, and no, no dislocation? Um, no, not with, not with that, no. Very interesting. So that's a very good tool if you use especially a screw-based basement. Now there is all this explosion now of augmented level components. Some are off the shelf. They're mostly designed for primary, but they can come very handy in a revision setting. And then the ultimate would be to replace the whole glenoid with a ball reconstruction system. Stephanie, do you have an opinion on the patient match ball reconstruction system? I've heard people that are very much in favor because it follows the oncology for hip and knee arthroplasty. And I've heard people saying, I am really worried because now my whole glenoid is metal and I'm anchoring just a few screws in the coracoid and laser. So do you have an opinion about the value of these newer ball reconstruction systems? Yeah, I mean, I've only, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I've never used it myself. I've only seen it once. And unfortunately, it was a patient who had this entire glenoid reconstructed and it was fixed, I think with like four or five screws, but when he came to my clinic, the entire thing was out. And so that's a scary thing, you know, that have this uh, big piece of metal concept, a custom implant come out uh, and floating around the shoulder. So I have, I, I'll be honest, I have very little experience putting it in myself. And I think this dilemma will continue in terms of, you, do you still do bone grafting? Do you use metal augmentation or do you do a combination? And then when do you use the line that uh, Dr. Frankel described? So what about the humerus? Because humeral bone loss also occurs in a revision surgery sometimes. And I think the important thing to realize for our fellows is that I think that substantial humeral bone loss actually matters. So you have a patient where there is a fair amount of missing bone. In my judgment, there are four things that can get you in trouble. Number one, your component is not gonna have great support. So there is real risk of loosening. Number two, Without the tuberosity, the deltoid typically has worse tension, even if you lateralize a lot with your implants. Number three, there is nowhere to attach the rotator cuff, so the risk of dislocation and poor function increases. And also, the temptation that you will have is to sink the component more, and that will also lead to dislocation. So when you face a patient that is missing a fair amount of bone, you have to think about how to deal with it. And I think that today we have five options, which is actually pretty good. I think revision shoulder arthroplasty has improved so much over the last five years. One of them is to use cement within cement. So this is a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see, the patient had a total level arthroplasty by Dr. Bernie Morey and a total shoulder by Dr. Robert Caulfield. Years later, the shoulder arthroplasty has failed as expected after all these years. And now you have to do a revision and that's a cemented component. You can see how when you expose the shoulder, you realize that there's a fair amount of bone missing, but if you look at the x-ray, there is an elbow underneath. So anything that you would think about using a long stem 
or some type of front reconstruction with an APC becomes complicated in the presence of an elbow arthroplasty. So in this case, I just cemented a new component and the patient did well. We published on this in 2017 and Dr. Frankel just reported his experience. So Mark, what have you learned about cement within cement after completing your paper? What are the main lessons for our fellows? When so, to cement within cement? So, you know, I, I, I like that technique because I, I found that, that we had a, a similar outcome. I think we had about 80 patients similar to yours. And uh, we had about an eight or 9% failure rate on the humoral side which was very similar to yours. And we tried to figure out why that was. And in, in that paper, we thought it related to the amount of cement that we could put within the old cement mantle. And so we thought that the more cement you could put within the existing stem within stem construct, that would provide a better chance of the humeral component not loosening. Um, but we only had eight cases. So we went back and did a biomechanical study. And really what I've learned is you want to put in the largest stem you can in a cement within cement construct because it provides so much more rotational stability. In fact, if you have a six stem that you cement within a cement mantle versus a 10, um, you have a substantial micromotion with the six, but even with five centimeters of bone loss, you do not see the same uh, type of bone uh, micromotion with a 10 stem. So you probably don't need any other additional bony support if you can really go up in diameter and cement in the biggest diameter possible. Very good. So this can really save the day when you actually in practice because this revision can be made somewhat easy if you do a cement within cement technique. The other option is to gain length and offset with a standard implant. So just imagine you have a shoulder where there is a fair amount of bone missing on the humeral side. You can gain your length by placing your base plate as low as possible as you can see on the diagram on your right using the biggest possible glenosphere that you dial inferiorly, cementing the component a little proud, and using the thickest possible bearing. So many times you can actually compensate for moderate humeral bone loss with a standard component. However, sometimes the amount of bone missing is just too much. And I think there is three emerging technologies that can help us in patients with more substantial, we could call catastrophic bone loss. One is the concept of using a modular conical titanium tapered fruited stem, sorry for the length of the name, and that is borrowed from the hip arthroplasty world. So as you, I think all know, at least for my hip partners, the use of a titanium stem has become the gold standard uh, in hip revision surgery. Now the humerus is different, and I have a lot of concerns about this reconstruction, but I think it has a role in some patients. So this is one example of one of these components. And as you can imagine, and I think that's the first thing that will come to mind, is the concern that if you have so much coating and this becomes well fixed and then infected, to remove this is a bone destroying operation. So Stephanie, do you think that this type of philosophy will play the same role in the shoulder as it has played in the hip or not really? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't, I think that's a little aggressive with the amount of coating that there's in, in there. I mean, you, you destroy the half of the humerus trying to take that out. I would agree. Mark? I'm more worried about the modular junctions. You know, all the biomechanical work we've done looking at humeral bone loss, um, it's, uh, it's a great amount of torsional force because of the semi-constrained nature of the implant. So if you have a modular junction that is exposed, meaning that your bone loss is such that you don't have the modular junction protected, um, I, I think there's some grave concerns that eventually that junction will fail from fatigue, no matter how stout you might imagine it to be. Um, that's, that's correct. I have seen actually a couple of x-rays with this system where the screw has come out to your point. So they can easily disassemble if you don't really lock the locking mechanism. So that's something to, to take into account. I, I think even if you get it right though, Joaquin, I think that the modular, because the amount of torsional forces in daily life activities because of the weight of the arm, when you try to bring your arm and abduct, it's, it's unbelievable. That's why I think if you're gonna do something like this, you need to augment it with some bony support to protect that junction. So you transfer the tr torsional loads from the proximal bone more distally. So the more bone loss you have, the more torsion that those junctions are going to see distal. I would agree. 
So this is one case that uh, I have resolved using this stem. I didn't know what else to do. So this patient had a total shoulder arthroplasty that became infected and then had a fracture. They plated the fracture. They, he had ongoing infection. So by the time I met the patient, he had an infected non-union and the quality of the bone that you can see on the x-ray on your left. So I thought that in order to get some type of stability, I had to combine something long inside the bone, cementless because of the fracture, and then augment with a plate. So this is what I did, and this is the x-ray at one year, where you can see how the combination of distal feet, uh, using it almost as an IM nail, combined with the plate, provided a welcome in this patient. But again, I think the jury is still out. To Dr. Frankel's point, this system is protected because the proximal humerus is there. Very different if you try to use this stem with completely no proximal humerus. I would agree completely. So we'll see if this will pan out in the field of shoulder arthroplasty. Another option, which is pretty popular, is to use modular segmental replacements because they are somewhat quite can easy. So you can see two different models that I have used in my practice. You can see the biomet implant to your left and then the exact to your right. I have no conflict of interest. Both systems are kind of nice because you can, it's almost like playing with a Lego. You can use the different modules to get your length and you can trial and then you replicate everything. So Mark, what's your gut feeling? Any indications in your practice today for a tumor prosthesis in revision surgery or is it all APC? You know, I have one patient that I have scheduled coming up in the next two months um, where I am going to use the exact modular humerus and I'm actually going to use the vault reconstruction uh, on, on the glenoid side. Um, so I, I don't know how that will work, but in this patient, uh, she's had it's, you know, multiple revisions and uh, a significant bone loss, both on the glenoid and the humerus. And she had an infection that was very difficult for us to finally eradicate. So I'm not, I don't want to use any allograft on her. Um, so I thought, well, this, this is probably uh, a reasonable thing to consider, so I'll let you know. Stephanie, any opinion or experience with this type of prosthesis in the very complex revision case? Yes, yeah, um, I'm relatively familiar with the exact tech uh, oncologic pr uh, prosthesis. Uh, I use it relatively frequently. I am not um, as excited about using an allograft. I, I just haven't had the same luck um, it, with the resorption. I've actually seen it fail on me a few times. So I've, I've gone to using this and I've been pretty happy with it. And what I like about this is that I can also, uh, they have different lateralization options to help recreate tension. So, so far I've been happy with it. Now, one of the claims with some of the systems is that you can add these porous titanium plates and the soft tissues will actually grow into them. And this is what I think um, we don't know for sure if we have enough basic science or clinical data to know that soft tissue will grow into porous titanium. Maybe it will, uh, but that is what pushes me more to an APC is when I have to do a soft tissue reconstruction. If I don't have to do a soft tissue, I will also use these implants occasionally, especially for the medium size defects like in these patients. But I think the jury is still out. Yes, Bill. I cannot hear you, sorry. Can you guys hear Dr. Levine? No. No. I don't know why, Bill, we cannot hear you, sorry. You can maybe chat the question if you want and Ryan can type it for you. So the challenge with these uh, systems is that there are failures like Stephanie mentioned and the two that they worry about the most are loosening. If you have a cylindrical system that is cemented distally, you can get loosening and dislocation. So I have used them and I have had dislocations myself. Like this is my case. This is a, a patient I did years ago. So this, uh, I'm showing cases that from Mayo that, that have failed with this implant, but sometimes they work really well. So just as a fellow remember, as Dr. Frank has told me multiple times, if you do complex surgery, you are gonna get complications. There's no way around it. No one except one of my very good friends claims not to have complications after doing a uh, complex revision surgery. And then the final thing, which I actually learned from Dr. Frankel, so Dr. Frankel was the first individuals that published on the use of APCs in revision surgery with Dr. Chacon. That's a beautiful paper that everyone should read as a fellow. And he has a follow-up paper with Dr. McClendon that has incredible long-term follow-up. But APCs are almost my favorite thing to do, and I'm biased because I, I like to do 
the technique. And the reason is mostly the soft tissue. So what I tend to do when I do an APC is try to order a bone graft that comes with allograft tendon because I am interested in decreasing my dislocation rate and providing some function. And the other thing that I have uh, used my whole career is compression plating. This is something I learned from uh, two uh, surgeons from Argentina that uh, did two more surgery, Muscolo and Ayerza. They used to do osteoarticular allografts without prosthesis for tumors and they had incredible union rates. So I copied the technique from these Argentinians to do my uh, APC reconstruction. And I think that when you have that plate, it will provide more rotational stability to the construct. And if you have the rotator cuff, you can then uh, go ahead and uh, uh, fix your rotator cuff. So this is how an APC is done in real life. Let's see if I can get the volume down, sorry for that. So you can see how in this case, we don't have a major defect, but we're gonna use the APC because the patient needs the soft tissue reconstruction. So it's only four and a half centimeters of bone missing. And the way I like to do it is I do a transverse cut. I know that Dr. Frankel has been uh, very successful using a strut um, extensions of the graft. And then I use my broach handle to make sure that I fit my graft to the coast in the adequate version. And I will use compression plating, which I think will provide nice ability for the host to the graft to heal under compression and also provide that rotational stability, which is so important to avoid humeral loosening. And once I have all the screws in place, then I will go ahead and cement. A very small, silly, but important tip is to place the screws with the brooch in. Because if you don't have the brooch in, you can place the screws in a position that they will block your stem. So I always place the screws with the brooch in, then I wanna go ahead and cement my component. And this is the part that I like the most in this patient the native calf was actually intact. So you can see how before relocating the shoulder, I am placing a number of sutures. And once they are all placed, but not tied, we're gonna relocate the joint. Then we can repair either the patient's native subscapularis or the pectoralis major to the subscapularis tendon, and you can tie the posterior sutures. And I think when doing that, you can get a pretty good outcome. So we've talked already about what's a special about shoulder arthroplasty, how to do a simple revision, how to deal with bone loss. Now, what about the soft tissues? Uh, Joaquin, what if you, Joaquin yes. question. How much lengthening on the humeral side do you generally consider before worrying about traction neuropraxia? On the femur, they say it's generally about three centimeters. So a question about how do you, how do you ensure that and, for, uh, and how much lengthening? So I would say two to four centimeters, I think would be my threshold in the papers that have been published on primary reverse, mostly by Dr. Walsh, is between two and four centimeters where you get in trouble. The problem is that in the revision setting, oftentimes the soft tissues are contracting. So my, my, my most common problem is that I cannot get the length that I wish. Like I measured on the other x-ray and I, I cannot get that much length and relocate the joint. How about you, Mark? Have you run into that problem in the OR? where you are uh, aiming for seven centimeters and you just can't because you will not relocate? Yeah, I, you know, in, in both of the allograft papers, uh, I didn't want to use an absolute amount of bone loss as a indication to use an allograft because uh, I, if the soft tissues are contracted, you, you're exactly, uh, your experience is exactly similar to mine, that you're unable to get the scarred tissue out to that length. So it has to be a combination of bone loss and, and soft tissue patulence that will allow me to uh, use an allograft. And instead of distalizing to get stability, I, I prefer lateralization. And as you said, I, I prefer to use the soft tissue attachments of the graft to also provide stability because that's what you're struggling with. And the last thing is, you know, if there's a lot of humeral bone loss, you know, my belief is if you put that shoulder in tight, you're, you are going to put more force across your fixation uh, on both sides of the joint. And since there's already been a humeral loosening problem with bone loss, I worry that this is going to be a problem. So, you know, it's always a balance between too tight and, and putting forces across the fixation or too loose and having instability. Very good. So finally, we'll talk about what if you really want to restore the soft tissue. So one situation that you may need to consider tendon transfers in the revision setting is when the patient has no active external rotation. So this patient, as you can see, 
had a reverse arthroplasty and one of the screws went through the suprascapular nerve and you can see on the metal saturation MRI how the infraspinatus is completely gone. So in this patient, we used a tendon transfer, we transferred the latissimus dorsi and the teres major posteriorly. This is the patient before surgery. Very interesting because she had a teres minor, she could actually elevate with the arm internal rotation, but she had no active external rotation. So we revised her, we removed the screws just to make sure that if there was any screw still affecting the nerve, uh, this could uh, help. And this is the patient at eight weeks after the tendon transfer. You can see how she just is starting her physical therapy, but she already has recovered active external rotation. So that's something to consider in the patient that has no external rotation, a lot torsi transfer. Now, what if you have a patient with the x-ray to your left, where the lat dorsi has been gone for a long time, then you cannot use it. So what we've been doing in few cases is uh, mobilize the soft tissues of the graft so that they are an extension of the posterior calf because otherwise the transfer will not reach and then combine the lower trapezius transfer that Dr. Lefrasan has described for the paralytic shoulder and for rotator calf repair salvage with an allograft. So what you would do is the same technique that I just mentioned but once you have your uh, host graft junction compressed with the plates and the screws and before you locate the shoulder, you're going to approach the shoulder in the back, harvest the lower trapezius and then fix it. And this is an example of such patient. You can see the allograft prepared so that it has a very long allograft extension. You can see in the center how there is an anterior incision for the vectoral and a posterior for the tendon transfer. Dual plating because this patient has severe osteopenia, mm -hmm. and this is the patient one year later with active external rotation after having no rotation for about 20 years after surviving from malignancy. And then, if you have no deltoid, my ex partner, Dr. Hassan, who is now in Boston, has described this pedicopetrice transfer, which I have never done myself, to be honest, but it's something that you can consider to read upon as a fellow. If you have a patient that may need a revision, you want to go reverse, and there is no deltoid. So I'm going to close with just a few final thoughts. So we have a few time for questions. And I think as I think about a summary of the whole presentation today, thank God for reversal of arthroplasty. I think about my mentor, Dr. Cofield, or, or Dr. Levin, maybe Dr. Neil, and Dr. Vigliani. When they were doing all these complex revision of arthroplasty without a reverse, that was difficult surgery. Reverse has helped a lot. Number two, when you do a primary, do not waste any glenoid. We have talked about how most of us don't really believe yet on that bone reconstruction system. We're using bone graft, but we don't have a great solution for the glenoid side. I think on the humerus, we have cement within cement, we have APCs, two more prostheses. Remember about the dilemma of uh, the C acnes, which I think is not so cute. And there is revisions of that light. You can do most of the primary, a standard, and then the pluses where you have to do complex bone reconstruction or soft tissue reconstruction. And luckily today we have multiple strategies. So cases that in the past we couldn't solve, like this patient that has a failed tumor prosthesis going through the elbow, today can be solved with complex surgeries like doing a reverse on one side and a total elbow on the other. Or a patient that has pretty much no glenoid, using bone graft, one is able to combine different reconstructions and get the patient a nice shoulder that hopefully will function better than what the patient had before. So this is the end of my presentation. We have uh, 10 minutes for comments and questions and answers. So Ranjan and Bill, if anything comes to the chat, we can open it up for questions and answers. Thank Joaquin, you very much. Can you, Joaquin, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. I just wanted to mention about the VRS system. Um, I, it is a, it's a game changer for the cases like Mark suggested. I've used it about a half dozen times. And I will tell the fellows though, you have to be very careful about the plan because I received one where the, the glenosphere was not in the right spot relative to the cage VRS. The VRS was perfect, but the glenosphere was the way they designed it, and I didn't catch it in time, was slightly superior so that when the patient AD ducted, they actually ran into the rest of the VRS uh, cage and dislocated. And I had to end up revising it and changing the, uh, I had to get a custom glenosphere that came down and covered that. So it was just a, a, a very harsh learning uh, point for me because I was so focused on fixation into the native glenoid defect that I actually under 
I didn't pay enough attention to the glenosphere sitting on the rest of the VRS. So just a, a take home point for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would say that that's one of the problems that when you start looking at fixation um, independent of sphere uh, balancing, it, that's, that's a challenge. So you know that you, you have so many things to consider, version, inclination, offset, and uh, when you get these custom implants, a lot of those things have to already be determined. And so you don't have the luxury of trying to assess your soft tissue balancing interoperatively. The other thing that we may run into problems in the future, depending on how things go on, is pricing. Also, those implants are very, very expensive. Now, at the same time, for those patients, there is really no other solution. So I think we have to come to peace about the expense of those reconstructions. Any other questions or comments? Yes, question for the group. How? Um, the idea of what does everyone do to, about finding the axillary nerve and deal and protecting or identifying the nerves in the revision situation? Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I usually will find the nerve almost in every case, but there have been a few cases where after attempting to try to find it, I felt that I was spending too much time. You know, I think the keys uh, are you need to find the coracoid and the conjoint tendon. And often, um, you know, you're so excited to get down deep, you don't do your superficial dissection. And I think once you can identify those structures, it really helps you orientate yourself to sort of then become aware of where you think the nerve is if you don't directly identify it. So Stephanie, any pearls about the actual nerve management in revision surgery? Yeah, so I don't always routinely go to identify it myself, um, but I do use uh, a lot of times the intraoperative nerve monitoring. And so I can use that to, if, I, if I'm in an area where I think I'm near the nerve, you can use this little stimulator and it kind of gives us an idea of how close I am to the nerve and it just gives me some, you know, caution to stay away from that certain area. Um, but I don't dissect out the nerve myself. I feel like we could do more damage uh, identifying the nerve um, by doing that. Joaquin, a uh, question from the uh, audience. Uh, tips for safe cable placement relative to our friend, the radial nerve. Yeah, so I think uh, that uh, requires a lot, of, a lot of care. And I myself do not pass any cables blindly. You know, there is all these studies. Uh, I think Larry Gulotta did one, and I think uh, Tom Norris another one, trying to reference the radial nerve uh, to the latissimus dorsi and either stay above or below. But, you know, in these complex cases, there is a scar tissue sometimes. So what I do is when I'm going to pass a cable, I actually dissect all the way around myself in that particular location. How about you, Bill? Do you have any tips or tricks for the fellows? No, you know, we have the, the, the centimeter measurements based on the lateral pecondyle going proximal and from the proximal going distal. But I agree completely. I, I, I trust nobody. Um, and uh, trust no one, even myself. And I have to see the cable going around the, the humerus. And I don't think there's any way that you can avoid it. I've seen, I've seen skewered fascicles. I've seen the entire nerve. I've seen pretty much every complication uh, that's happened from well-intended well and well-trained surgeons that have uh, not followed that philosophy. Any other questions from the audience or from our fellows? Ranjan, anything coming through the chat? No, we've, we've, we've covered them all. Um, Perfect. One final question about the nerve. Stephanie, um, the, do you use the checkpoint nerve stimulator or do you do the SSP monitoring the way uh, Samir Nagda and other folks have talked about? Man, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what <laughs> system it is. Uh, my neurosurgeon uh, colleague actually showed it to me. Um, basically, it's this little portable uh, ner nerve stimulator that you you can use um, and it kind of just goes red or light, you know, red or green. Yeah, it is checkpoint. I okay. think what Ronjan is talking about is to do formal EMG monitoring. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that. I, I think uh, Joe Abud has published on that in the primary setting and also I think uh, JP Warner when doing lateral J studies, I haven't used it myself. I've used it, I, I was just talking about that with my fellows. I've used it in probably several hundred cases. Uh, and I recently have stopped, although um, I think in severe bone loss cases, it's probably a really helpful thing. Um, uh, 
you know, it, it's basically what our spine colleagues do. Uh, the things that make it different is you cannot give that patient a, a block. So they have to go on inhalation anesthetic. Now you can have your anesthesiologist put a catheter and not dose that catheter until the end of the case, but you'll find that it's a lot harder for the anesthesiologist to, to uh, monitor their pressure. It becomes much more labile, but, and it takes a bit more time. It, you have to put these little electrodes in, uh, but it is uh, something I've used as well. Great. Uh, Joaquin, I just wanted to, to make a comment to the fellows. Um, if it, it looks like you're wrapping up, uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that go to the uh, ASCS website um, by next week. Uh, we did a follow up to the to our uh, anatomic total shoulder uh, core curriculum talk with George Athwal and Joaquin and myself uh, to cover the things that we didn't get to cover in the first session. So we recorded a second hour session on uh, the delta pectoral approach. Uh, approach to the glenoid and glenoid implantation. So um, you'll find that on the website next week, we hope. Well, thank you, Ranjan and Bill, for moderating us. Stephanie, Mark, you guys are awesome and incredible experts. So I learned a lot, and I hope that the fellows had a good, uh, good time too. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And, uh, thanks, Joaquin, for leading us. Good night. Thank you. Bye.